So this is called Scales of Belonging. Uh, I changed the title, um, actually moved some things around, and this is going to be the first part of two, two parts uh, that deal with the U.S. engagements with Native nations other than the Hopi tribe, um, and that's part of the plan here, or Native peoples other than Hopi peoples as well. So f I'm going to do an introduction as I usually do. I'll get into questions of U.S. recognition and specifically the Office of Federal Acknowledgement, which will be um, the uh, institution, the agency that I'll be talking about explicitly today. Uh, and then I will talk about uh, a particular encounter that um, one uh, California uh, nation uh, I uh, worked with had with this um, office and the out outcome upshot of that. And then I'll sum up with some final words. So first, an introduction. Now, here we are, four, week four, uh, and I have been pressing you to uh, join with me in an ethnographic endeavor. That is, I've asked you in various ways to consider these questions uh, as central to what we do when we do ethnography. Um, I've asked you to consider if you were thrown into a situation where you were being asked to make sense of uh, systems, in, uh, engagements, encounters that were unfamiliar to you, what would you have to know in order to have a good understanding of what was going on? And I've suggested that what you would have to know raise certain questions, depending on what we mean by good, of course, uh, certain questions that I think dovetail with the different moments of sort of crisis that anthropology has been in over the years. Uh, questions about that I, uh, empiricism, what is it that we can actually study, observe in an ethnographic encounter? What is it that we can know factually, for the, one might say, about the world with which we're encountering and engaging when we engage with uh, ethnographically? Questions of uh, the ethical, um, that is, what is it that ought to be going on and what is it that we ought to be doing in this moment? And then finally, questions of the instrumental, that is, what uh, are specifically the things that are being accomplished by the social actors we observe in this moment? And that knowing all three of those dimensions really sort of captures the essence, I think, of what uh, ethnography really is. And by the way, just as a as as an, as a as a side point, um, there was uh, a series of lectures given by um, by a very esteemed uh, uh, colleague of mine, well, uh, an esteemed anthropologist, Professor Didier Fassin of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, in Princeton, and the uh, three. Ele the three topics, he gave three lectures in three days. I guess that's what you do when you're, you, you crunch it all into three days. Um, they dovetailed pretty much with this stuff, questions of fact, questions of ethics, and questions of politics. Uh, I'm calling it instrumental because I think politics is too loaded in some ways. But really, these three dimensions, and Professor Fassan and I did not call and coordinate. We didn't talk to each other ahead of time. It was just happenstance. So I think that there's, I'm on, I feel like I'm on to something. Um, and so I want to keep pursuing that. Um, and I want to keep pursuing this question of what we mean by epistemology and epistemological limits, what we mean by knowledge when we mean a justified true belief. And the suggestion, as we pointed out in lecture two, that uh, the, what it means to know something means to be authoritative. In your, in your claim uh, about a true belief. Authoritative insofar as it is uh, something that is not just a true belief, but a justified true belief, um, and that it is reliable and taken to be reliable, and that embedded in that uh, is not just authority, that is some sort of legitimacy, but even recognition that you are legitimately a knower, so that someone else observes you and sees and assesses your claim to have some angle on the world in your beliefs and truths about the world, and justify and find that those are legitimate. 
And that in lecture two, I also talked about how in the specific context of Hopi, this has a very particular kind of um, understanding and meaning, uh, one that dovetails and, and turns not so much on a sort of whole claim to be, to be knowledgeable about and authoritative about everything, but in fact, to know only your portion of the world and as a result, to be very much aware of the limits of your knowledge. And insofar as you are uh, aware of your limits in a Hopi way, from a Hopi perspective in the community, you have uh, an opportunity to be part of a larger whole, to be in relationships of recognition and respect in which everyone has a specific kind of authoritative, of authoritative knowledge, a role to play, um, and the idea that what authoritative and uh, powerful expressions look like and what authority and power look like at Hopi um, and, social, and social action look a lot like uh, what Emery Sekiakwaptewa, my mentor, uh, once described as cooperation without surrender. And what that really means, this is really foreign in some ways to our to sort of Euro-American ways of thinking about the world. And so teasing that out has been a big part of the first uh, two substantive lectures that I gave and really sort of part of the driving uh, understanding of what it is that I'm getting at with uh, relating knowledge uh, to authority. And then finally, uh, last week's lecture, I talked about how we can think about this in terms of jurisdiction. And I've argued that this question of Hopi epistemological limits as an expression of authority uh, is something that is being exercised not only by and between Hopi people themselves, but it also explains why Hopi people insist upon and refuse the access that some ethnographers and other non-Hopi people uh, demand of Hopi cultural practices and Hopi sacred beliefs and Hopi navoti or tradition, traditional knowledge, but that in that insistence they are expressing a kind of jurisdiction that is not only a scope of authority, a claim to a certain kind of right and uh, an, an ability to judge what is authoritative with regard to Hopi, but also equally in this notion of cooperation without surrender, an invitation to a specific kind of relationship, a relationship of recognition, respect, and cooperation in some instances. And I tried to play that out and show that as it played out, where it worked, where it didn't work in certain contexts um, uh, involving the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office and its engagements with different non-native institutions. And to do so, I made this case that we can think of jurisdiction not just in terms of the scope of power, uh, not just in terms of um, the idea of having a power over a specific kind of number of individuals or a specific territory, but that we also can think of it as a way of speaking, a kind of expression of speaking the law that at once enacts that authority, enacts that social power, but then in some ways is always pointing beyond itself, is always saying that this enactment is just the latest instance of a general authoritative form of way, way of being form of culture or institutional authority. We can think of that as a court of law, we can think of it as a ceremonial society, we can think of it however you like. But that jurisdiction, in fact, involves this sort of everyday talking power into existence, talking authoritatively but in a way that always says that that authority doesn't start right here and now, it's always something that I'm just hooking myself up to, and it exists, it pre-exists me, and it will pre-exist all of us into the future, or it will, it will exist past us in the future. What I wanna, I zip through those because I'm worried about time but they just go into the points I just described. But what I want to do for today is I want to ask whether or not these insights, these questions about epistemological limits, the questions about knowledge as a modes of authority and relationality, can be, and questions of knowledge as an expression of a kind of juris dictio, a speaking of a normativity, a speaking of law, can be extended beyond the Hopi context, can be extended to other native nations, and their encounters with non-native institutions. Can we understand how knowledge in those contexts enacts, knowledge and its limits, enacts or is refused 
uh, in its expressions of a kind of authority? Can we understand how expressions of authority and expressions of knowing in a particular way demand, insist upon, or otherwise involve relations of a kind of recognition? That is, of a kind of assessing and being assessed as being knowledgeable about whatever it is that you're claiming to know something. For this week, I want to turn specifically then to questions of recognition, and what better place to do that than to what is generally understood as US, in the US legal system as processes of federal recognition. That is, how tribes uh, become tribal nations, or at least not become tribal nations, get recognized finally as the tribal nations that they are. That's probably the better way to put it. That is to say, how do they get recognized as such by the federal government and thereby get authorized by the federal government as an entity with which the federal government can have a government-to-government -government relationship? There is a long and problematic history with questions of recognition, and specifically with the ways in which questions of recognition, that is, how settler colonial states like the United States or like Canada uh, dovetail and understand politics of recognition as they relate to issues of uh, self-determination. That is the authority or capacity of nations, native peoples, and others to define for themselves who they are. As we'll see, this plays out not just in the abstract about the relations between native nations and, uh, and, federal, and federal institutions, settler colonial institutions, but actually plays itself out in the, every, in the details of how they talk to each other. And, I, and I'm hoping to be able to show that to you. And finally, I want to ask, what counts as knowledge, as knowing who a tribal nation is? And what are the conditions that make that evaluation possible in the first place? As I will show you, there is a real difference between the kinds of federal criteria that are involved in knowing whether a tribal nation is who they claim to be, and in fact, how a tribal nation itself organizes, defines, and comes to understand their community of belonging and being part of a whole. We will look at the Office of Federal Acknowledgement, the OFA, which is an office that has been in the, in the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, since 1997. Um, before that, there was a different office called the Office of Federal Acknowledgement, I mean, I'm sorry, the Office, the Bureau of, um, of Acknowledgement and Research. And I'll talk a little bit about that history and how that changed. And then we'll talk about a little bit about the federal regulations that um, these offices were actually designed to implement and why and how those implementations have become and have been so problematic. What this office is responsible for doing is not just deciding cases of federal recognition, deciding petitions by non-federally recognized tribes on their status as tribal nations to be recognized or not, but what they're also charged with doing is assessing whether and inviting uh, opportunities for consultation with these petitioning groups to help understand what the requirements of the regulations are. So regularly they will meet with petitioners, with tribal groups who are not federally recognized yet, who will talk, want to meet with them and speak with some of their staff members about how to understand the, uh, the regulations themselves and how this very group, these staff members are going to apply the regulations to their petition. These petitions often take volumes and volumes and volumes of paper, historical documentary materials, genetic mater DNA materials, evidence of genealogies that are volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes. And you can imagine that many of these peoples who are um, not federally recognized uh, don't often have a lot of uh, help in preparing these things. And uh, this is a pretty onerous task. Um, and it takes years. And so I'll. I'll share a little bit with you about that as it relates to this one group. This is not the name of the tribe, that, uh, the actual name of the tribe in question, uh, 
I'm calling them the Moreno Band of Mission Indians, and a specific encounter that they had with with uh, some of these uh, assist with some of these uh, technical assistance meetings and consultations. One that took place in May 2005. Another that took place in August 2005. And what effect? and how to understand how that guidance that they got from the Office of Federal Acknowledgement did or did not assist them in uh, ultimately their final, uh, the final decision that was made about their status as a tribal people or a tribal nation. Okay. So a little bit about U.S. recognition. This is the process by which the federal government sets out to decide uh, or to deal with peoples who claim to be native um, in various ways. Now, why does the federal government, the US government, even have to concern itself with this? Uh, for many things, it doesn't, and for, for good reason, and shouldn't. Uh, native peoples are perfectly happy, for the most part, to being left well enough alone. Please don't bother me with whatever federal requirements there are. However, the fact of the matter is that with colonization, there has been put into motion a relationship, an uneasy relationship, between the inherent sovereignty of tribal peoples uh, recognized by U.S. law and the uh, authority and power of the settler colonial government to address and deal with uh, those issues uh, as it relates to um, to the government that the U.S. Uh, uh, implements for itself. We can trace the questions of federal recognition from the very beginning of the Union um, and actually prior to the beginning of the Union. Um, the first case is a case that I mentioned to you before, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, which was decided in 1831. This is where we get this language about domestic dependent nations in which tribal governments are, are called by Chief Justice John Marshall. This strange, contradictory statement, a domestic dependent nation which is kind of independent because their power pre-exists the passage of the Constitution, but kind of dependent because, in fact, they're inferior savages. Um, and so they are more like wards to the guardianship of the federal government. And this sets up not only the government-to-government -government relationship, but also sets up the what's called now the Federal Indian Trust Responsibility. That is, the responsibility that the federal government has by law and by policy to always act in the best interests of Native nations whenever presented with a set of circumstances and the decision that they have to make. Now, has the, tribe, have, has the U.S. government always done this in a way that Native peoples feel like is in their best interest? Absolutely not. And in many instances, the worst uh, and most egregious acts of federal policy have been taken in the name of uh, helping Native peoples uh, when it clearly uh, has, did not have that effect. And some of the things that I'll talk about uh, today uh, relate to that. However, I should say that the reason and where, and this is something that maybe has you you'd wondered about, I don't know, maybe not. Um, Chief Justice Marshall, the, the Supreme Court Justice, the U.S. Supreme Court Justice who issued this decision, Cherokee v. Georgia, did not come up with this idea out of clear blue. In fact, he looked to the U.S. Constitution and in two parts of the U.S. Constitution, Article I, Section 2, and Article I, Section 8, both of which describe Native peoples. The first one has to do with representation in Congress, Article I, Section 2, and it says that people who are, people who are taxed uh, shall get a, a proportional kind of representation unless they are, uh, it doesn't say this, but basically if you were a non-citizen, uh, then you wouldn't get it. Um, uh, you wouldn't have representation in Congress, but also if you are an Indian not taxed. And that's the language in the Constitution, Indians not taxed. Then in the second, situ in a second part, in Article I, uh, Section 8, um, it talks about um, how Congress has the right to regulate and the authority to regulate commerce between the states. Uh, this is called the Interstate Commerce Clause. It's an important part of congressional authority between the foreign governments and the U.S. and Indian tribes. And it is because Indian tribes are enumerated in these two places, Indian individuals not taxed, uh, 
and Indian tribes uh, as a separate entity, different than federal, foreign, body, foreign governments, different than states, that Marshall, decide, Marshall comes to the conclusion that it was always contemplated that native peoples who had not adopted citizenship or who had not given up their membership in their tribal nations were parts of semi-sovereign, semi-independent uh, uh, nations. And this set the stage. This was it. Where Congress has not taken away their sovereign status, then it was presumed that they had it. And this was, this set the stage for, and is still to this day, the reason why this domestic dependent nation status is so important for tribal nations. This is still good law for this day, to this day, and it reflects the recognition that there is a body that is a sovereign with which the U.S. government has a government-to-government -government relationship. Okay, so then why do we need recognition at all? Why isn't it just there automatically, unless otherwise stated, tribes are sovereign and they have to have a government-to-government -government relationship? Uh, they do implicitly. Well, several things have happened in the course of history to lead to that. Among them, Oh, I'm sorry. Among them is uh, in 1871 was the determination that the, uh, by Congress that it would no longer engage in treaties with uh, tribal peoples. This was the declaration of a kind of end of the Indian Wars, an acknowledgment of a sort of tacit recognition that all native peoples had been uh, conquered and there were no more native nations with whom to enter into treaties with and so there was no more, going to be no more treaty making. And shortly on the heels of that came what is generally known as the worst policy uh, uh, ever with, for, uh, as it relates to Native peoples, the Dawes Severalty Act or the General Allotment Act, which divided up reservations that had been set aside for Native peoples at various times and through various treaties, divided up nations, divided up, broke up tribal organizations, refused to recognize tribal peoples any longer, divided up their, their lands into individual property. And the net result was that roughly two thirds of all tribally held lands in the US were lost, like in the matter of 10 years. Not just because they were eventually found their ways, these individual land holdings eventually found their ways into the hands of non-Indians, but because the excess lands, the surplus lands, after individuals were given the land, were all turned over to the U.S. government and sold off in various ways or held by the U.S. government. This was considered an unmitigated disaster. And by 1934, the general assessment had been Native peoples had not been made better by the Allotment Act despite whatever the, the reports to the contrary, despite the idea that this would assimilate Native peoples, lift them up, get them to be like good Americans. In fact, they suffered uh, tremendously as a result. And so uh, in 1934, a massive overhaul of Indian policy was initiated. And with it came uh, under the gu uh, guise of what's called the Wheeler Howard Act or the Indian Reorganization Act. And in the Re Indian Reorganization Act, we have for, uh, for uh, one of the most important statements of how uh, Indian peoples can be recognized by the federal government for the purposes of benefiting from this newfound reorganized relationship. What the Indian Reorganization Act essentially did was put a stop to the Allotment Act, put a stop to the acts of, of dismantling tribal nations, and said, instead what we're gonna do is we are gonna recognize the existence of tribal nations, we're gonna assist them in the creating of constitutions, and various kinds of government policies, and we're going to enter into government-to-government -government relationships with them, and we're also going to provide benefits uh, that to support them in their efforts at self-government. Um, a bunch of different uh, uh, kinds of benefits uh, that we're going to uh, redound not only to the individual nations, but also to individual Indians. And the question became, how would you know who was an Indian, especially after nearly 60 years of dismantling Indian tribes? And Section 19 of the Indian Reorganization Act gives you some language to help do that. It says, an Indian, for the purposes of this act, shall include all persons of Indian descent who are members of an Indian tribe now under federal jurisdiction. That was tribes who were already recognized, already recognized by the federal government, 
and all persons who are descendants of such members who were, as of June 1st, 1934, residing within the reservation, and furthermore, shall include all individuals of one half or more Indian blood. This is the first expression we get of so-called blood quantum. People think that many na native nations today have instantiated this idea of blood quantum in their own membership requirements. You have to have a certain percentage of native blood and usually of, this, of the actual tribe that you're claiming to be a member of. But here is the first expression of it. And it really is a federal measurement, a way of scaling and measuring who native peoples are, what Indianness is. It's an imperfect one. And frankly, I think it's quite an awful one um, that was designed to capture something other than what it's capturing. But what we can, uh, and what, it's, what it is attempting to capture is a recognition that very often native peoples were peoples who were living together uh, in these communities, either not recognized on a reservation, not having a government-to-government -government relationship. There were many tribes who had been almost virtually dismantled or who had never had a treaty with the federal government. And so we wanted to capture as many native peoples as we could, even those, and have them fall under and benefit from the Indian Reorganization Act, even those who may not be members of recognized federal Indian tribes, mem members of these tribes. And so the thought was blood quantum could get you there. The effect of it, though, is a kind of racial category. And what we see embedded in the 1934 um, uh, Section 19 is both a political expression of a kind of recognition, right? Recognition as being a member of a tribe that is recognized as such, but also a racial one. And many tribes have adopted this as a way of excluding certain members of their communities or not in various kinds of difficulties uh, in trying to decide who should be a member and how they should be a member. Um, and it's had pretty deleterious effects, negative effects on many nations uh, around the country. Um, but what this blood quantum measure does do is opens up the possibility that just because you weren't a federally recognized tribe at the time that this law was passed, that you couldn't at some later time be recognized as a tribe and therefore enjoy the benefits of being a, having a government-to-government -government relationship. And so this sets in motion the whole recognition process that comes afterwards, and this becomes important again because at this time, today we have 566 federally recognized tribes. There were not that many federally recognized tribes at this time in 1934. And in fact, there was yet another round of efforts to dismantle them. 1953, the end of the war, a lot of Native peoples come home who had fought in the wars. They were, uh, the, the, more importantly, the U.S. government was figuring out how they were going to spend down the war bills, uh, pay off the war bills, and they uh, had spent a lot of money, and they thought, well, the Indians are a good place to go and get some, some cash that is not needed elsewhere. And so they really started dismantling the whole infrastructure that was set up by the IRA. And the idea was to pass this law called Public Law 280, otherwise known as the Termination Bill. This law identified several states, named states, to unilaterally cede federal authority over tribes to these, uh, to these state governments. Um, this authority usually involved allowing tribes to exercise self-government in one way or another. And so the net effect of turning this authority over to states was that states now could decide for themselves whether they were going to allow tribes to exercise self-government. Um, the states that are named, uh, there were six uh, states that were named that had mandatory uh, termination of all Indian nations except otherwise named, and there was one or two in each of these states that were exempted. Um, and these include California, Minnesota, Nebraska, Oregon, Wisconsin, and Alaska. Um, this has a tremendous effect on whether or not tribes in these states are presumed to be recognized by the federal government. Very often they're not. Um, other states had the option of joining up, and some did and some didn't. This whole uh, era ushered in a period uh, which some of my mentors and advisors and um, up until the 1990s had finally been able to sort of 
uh, help explain how detrimental and deleterious this was, we hear about, for example, um, the terrible problems with crime in many parts of Native America. Well, in the places where Public Law 280 is in force, you're dealing with small populations in relatively rural areas, and the burden of policing these places falls to the states. And I can tell you right now, the states are not all that interested in policing it. So you end up, Public Law 280 ends up creating states of lawlessness in a way that uh, otherwise was, seen, was, um, was not in, in place. Uh, and it's been a terrible, again, another really bad uh, policy move that is still in force in some places. In fact, California is still a Public Law 280 state. However, tribes now can pursue federal recognition even there. Come 1975, and the termination policy era is, is also deemed to be a problem. And so we have this Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act of 1975. This is an act I've mentioned before. This is the act that really starts to recognize the political sanctity of Native nations. This is the one that recognizes that their interests in self-determination and sovereignty are paramount among all others, um, and that that wanting that kind of autonomy and uh, independence should not come at the expense of federal support. And that's what the ISDEA attempts to instantiate, and with it, a revitalization of efforts at federal acknowledgement and recognition. So that period of termination ends, and with the passage of the ISDEA, you get clamoring for a more structured way of tribes to get federal recognition. What had been happening from 1934 forward was that if you were a tribe that was not recognized by 1934, or before 1934, in order to get recognition, you had to go to Congress and get Congress to pass a bill, or you had to get the president to issue an executive order, and in rare cases, you could get a court to find that there had been some mistake in your termination practice, in the policies of termination against you, or something like this, and that in fact you're federally recognized. Um, these were all very piecemeal and ad hoc and often turned on things that uh, had nothing to do with the legitimacy of the claim. Completely mishmash, uh, a complete mess of a process. In fact, no process, really. So in 1978, after several um, internal papers were circulated, an effort was uh, put, it, put in place to regulate and to create a process of federal acknowledgement. And this is the first time 25 CFR Code of Federal Regulations, Section 83, is expressed. And this is the process now by which most tribes now are pursuing a government-to-government -government relationship uh, if they were not recognized in 1934. So this is the process that's in place to this day. However, it too uh, has been beset by problems of various types. Um, it created at first a branch of acknowledgement and research, a BAR office that would hear these, uh, hear petitions by tribal peoples for federal acknowledgement. Uh, they essentially, in their first, they, they, they they acknowledged, they heard two cases and made decisions on them uh, early on in the first few years and then sat on their hands and went decades without taking any action. Uh, there was concerns of political influence shaping this effort. Uh, there was co concerns about um, no transparency with regard to this, uh, these processes and how they were instantiated. And so a major effort was made to reform them and to reform the criteria by which tribes could get recognition. And these reforms have been put in place in 1997, and then they were reformed again, and just recently instantiated in 2015. Um, still, though, of course, there are people who are not happy with the practices of acknowledgement and recognition, uh, and they have um, a, a lot of problems with how the process goes down for various reasons. One thing I want to point out before I go on is that these the acknowledgement process has recently been uh, um, challenged in an interesting way by the U.S. Supreme Court. In this Carcieri versus Salazar case, the court held that 
the language of the Indian uh, uh, Reorganization Act did not intend to create tribes uh, that could uh, take land um, after 1934. So if you were a tribe that was recognized in 1934, good on you. You can take all the land you want. You can have land taken and held by the federal government for your benefit. If you were a tribe created after 1934, sorry, you're out of luck. You don't get any land. Don't ask the federal government. That's not what the Indian Reorganization Act was all about. This has thrown everything into disarray. There are a number of tribes that are gaming tribes that were not recognized in 1934, and the question of the validity of their regulatory, their uh, gaming practices are in, are in question. Um, there have been efforts, uh, efforts by lobbyists for Native nations to try to reform or to try to change the law to, uh, to address this problem. They're called the Carcieri Fix. This is still being uh, pursued. Um, and I'm not sure where the efforts are at this time. But the threat to tribal federal recognition is alive and seems to always come up in these ebbs and flows at different times when people seem to think that Native peoples are getting a little too ahead of themselves or something. I'm not sure why it comes up when it comes up. There are, as I said, 566 federally recognized tribes today. Since the creation of the acknowledgement process, 59 tribes, uh, 59 different groups petitioned uh, uh, and registered a claim through the process to be recognized. 18 were have been acknowledged to date, 33 have been denied, and eight are still in process. Some of these petitions have taken over 30 years to be addressed. Um, so I can tell you that a lot of th these stats have just recently changed with the efforts to put in a new process. Um, there was a government accounting agency uh, internal review of the Office of Federal Acknowledgement and it was found to be rife with problems, deemed essentially to, um, to uh, lack transparency um, and to be too subject to political influence. Um, in part because it has a staff of about four or five people, um, uh, a genealogist, a historian, and the person who wrote the, the regulations, basically. Um, and uh, they seem to have uh, been in place for a long time and don't seem to be all that amenable to uh, genuinely considering claims. At least that's been the, that's how people in native countries, native nations, have seen the OFA as, as less of a facilitator toward federal recognition and more as a, uh, a, uh, a, gate, a gate watcher, um, um, standing by and preventing people from getting federal recognition. So the process has been anything but um, uh, seen as uh, uh, the best one uh, available. In light of that, let's turn to the Moreno Band and their meeting with the OFA. Here's a picture of the Moreno Band. I've blocked out the names of the actual band, but this is their tribal flag back there. Um, this is their headquarters. This is the band as I met them. Uh, I actually met them in 2011 um, as they were at the final stages of getting their recognition petition decided. Um, the meeting that I'm going to describe actually took place in 2005. On August 29, 2005, I'm going to read a little here. Um, a meeting was taking place in Washington, D.C. between the leaders of a mid-sized Southern California Native American tribal group and the staff of the Office of Federal Acknowledgement in the Federal Bureau of Indian Affairs. The process, which as I said is outlined in 25 Part 83, of the Code of Federal Regulations has been, since 1978, the primary way in which tribes petitioned the federal government for legal recognition as a domestic dependent sovereign. That is, how they can join the other 566 tribal nations currently enjoying a government-to-government -government relationship with the U.S. and the duties and rights that go along with that status. The process itself requires petitioning Tri uh, petitioning tribal groups to submit evidence uh, in the form of historical and contemporary records, including primary documents, secondary literatures, 
uh, and their analyses sufficient for the staff of the OFA to make a reasonable finding based on certain mandatory criteria set out at 83.7. This mandatory requ uh, criteria require, among other things, uh, that the petitioning group itself has been identified as an Indian entity in a substantially continuous basis since 1900, is a distinct community from historical times to the present with political influence and authority over its members. Members who are themselves descendants of a historical Indian tribe. These regulations and the OFA itself were originally established in an effort to formalize a practice of federal tribal recognition that since the 1930s had been accomplished by piecemeal. Unfortunately, the 83.7 process itself has come under heavy and repeated critiques, including the finding of several congressional hearings for its own lack of transparency and interminable bureaucratic delays. Indeed, at the time that the meeting that is the subject of this paper took place, the tribal group in question, the Moreno, had been waiting for 28 years without any action being taken on their petition. In the ensuing period, the regulations themselves had been revised, the office had been renamed, and 10 different secretaries of the Bureau of Indian Affairs had come and gone. And just this past few summers, uh, amendments to the regulatory language and procedures have been proposed by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and enacted to address these critiques it remains to be seen whether or not uh, these uh, changes will have the proper effect. I will argue that the enduring problems attending the acknowledgement process and which continue to plague it to this day may have something to do with slippery logics of scale. Scale with which the OFA and its procedures confront an attempt to measure tribal petitioners. Under the current regulations, petitioners must show that their individual members and their community as a whole can be traced back to a historic Indian tribe or tribes. To meet the mandatory criteria, OFA officials and the language of the guidelines and the regulations themselves advise petitioners that they rely on a variety of different kinds of materials and phenomena, individual documents, public, religious, and private archives, digital ancestry databases, even DNA evidence, to mine the historical record for proof of individual and group Indianness, both past and present, but also, importantly, of the continuity between the past and the present Indianness. In an effort to assist petitioners in understanding these evidentiary uh, demands, the regulations provide that the OFA will offer technical assistance meetings to petitioning tribal groups if and when they request them, prior to having their cases taken under active consideration, as well as later in the process before making their final decision. The meeting being held on that hot, muggy DC summer day in 2005 was one such advisory meeting a so-called technical assistance meeting that the tribal group in question, the Moreno, had requested after being told for the first time since filing their petition in 1993, that is 12 years later, that their petition was going up for active consideration in September of that year. Relying on analyses of transcripts of audio recorded interactions from that meeting, I will argue that the ways in which the utility of different documentary records are described by the office officials at once point up and hide the problems of measurement of scalability or non-scalability that emerge with these when these documents are held out as evidence of contemporary Indian individual or group's relationship to a historic Indian individual or group. As I will show in the interaction between the parties of this meeting, however, the talk repeatedly breaks down precisely in those moments where either the OFA officials or tribal leaders attempt to puzzle out when and how a particular kind of document can count simultaneously as evidence linking individuals to groups, linking present individuals and groups to, and past individuals and groups. 
It is this measurement of indeterminate scalability, discernible in the struggle, revealed in the struggle, to present claims of Indianness to historic and to tie them, to link them to established Indianness, as well as in efforts to link the Indianness of individuals to the Indianness of groups that is constituted by a kind of double bind. It makes a double bind within which the tribal groups themselves find themselves caught and which, as I will show in conclusion, ultimately lead the, to the OFA denying their petition for federal acknowledgement. Now, questions of scale and the capacity of social phenomena of one level of, scale, uh, of a scale to slide up or jump down to others, that is their scalability, have increasingly been taken up by theorists and researchers in the human sciences to challenge received imaginations or ima images of the social, political, and economic orders within which various kinds of processes are normalized by virtue of their natural capacities to stand in and for each other as they reify divides between micro and macro. Recent interventions by Latour caution us not to settle in it the scale in advance and instead to study scale itself, how scale is an accomplishment that does substantial work in figuring the thing that is getting scaled. It makes it and the persons caught up in and with those things. Likewise, Anna Singh argues persuasively for the need uh, for a theory of non-scalability to, quote, pay attention to the mounting piles of ruins that scalability leaves behind and to show how scalability uses articulations with non-scalability, uh, non-scalable forms, even as it denies or erases that there is such thing as a lack of scalability. In the context of actual instances of talk and text, matters of scale are worked out, that is through discourse, matters of scale are worked out through a variety of intertextual links by which speakers point to the fact that the objects of their texts or the texts themselves point to other textual or discursive moments, either as mutual tokens of a shared type or as iterations or other figurative kind of elaborations where social phenomena presupposed to be of one or another micro, macro scale um, stand for social phenomena of another scale in a way that is naturalized, normalized, taken for granted. A good example, I would suggest, of these scalar logics, whoops, skip that. A good example of these scalar logics appear in the federal acknowledgement processes themselves and more specifically in the guidelines that the Bureau of Indian Affairs passed in, published in 1997 to help petitioners understand what kinds of evidence will be required for meeting the criteria of 25 CFR 83.7. In one section, advising tribal groups who have hired professional researchers to assist with the preparation of their petitions, the guidelines suggest how precisely a combination of genealogists, historians, and anthropologists should be deployed in a manner mirroring their use by the Office of Federal Acknowledgement, who were then reviews those petitions. They explain, Start with the genealogy. Hire a genealogist first. They will try to trace your ancestry to a historic tribe. A historian will next build on what the genealogist has found by placing ancestors, the ancestors in a historical context. Finally, the anthropologist describes the social and political entity your ancestors maintained in the past and you maintain today. Don't hire them all at once. Stagger their work. This is generally how BIA researchers work too. At first glance, the suggested sequencing of expert advising from genealogist to historian to anthropologist seems to create an image of tribal per petitioners hoping to succeed as constituted of individuals whose various vital records can be mined for information, tracing their paternity back in time to other individuals, ancestors, who can at once be placed in a historical context. 
can be understood as collectively making up some larger group, one whose abstracted social and political entity can then be compared by an anthropologist to the contemporary social and political entity of the petitioner. In so doing, it is presumed the evidentiary line is laid for linking the present group of individuals constituting the petitioning, petitioner to a past group of indi individuals. But notice how, on even closer investigation, the lockstep scaling up already begins to be revealed for something much messier. Note how the genealogist's work is described as trying to trace your ancestry to a historic tribe. Unclear already in this scale is the scale, is the scale at which the second person possessive your and your ancestry uh, is working. Given that genealogists work with the records of individuals that mark their relationships to other individuals, birth certificates, baptismal records, marriage licenses, and others, and the extent to which the phrase your ancestry can both mark uh, the records of individuals and the archive of some group, the family, the lineage, the clan, the gens, the tribe, and immediately the problems emerge. The net effect is kind of a knowledge sleight of hand, an evidentiary sleight of hand. When the sliding movement up the scales from individual to group that seem otherwise t perfectly rational, uh, when talked about from the detailed perspective of the different domains of scientific expertise, actually proves much more opaque and underdetermined. This opacity, opacity becomes even more evident in the 2005 meeting I, uh, I focus on between OFA officials and the leaders of the tribal group, the Moreno. This meeting is opened by the OFA solicitor, explaining that the office had two areas of concern about the evidence that the, of the petitioners uh, had put forward and which they wanted to convey to tribal groups leaders uh, so, that they might address, uh, so that they might address them before the petition was going to be taken up on active consideration. Significantly, these two areas of concern involve again genealogical issues as well as historical and documentation issues that we wanted to bring to your quick attention. Even here, in talking about kinds of evidence as areas of concern, the fields of information captured by the phrase genealogical issues are treated as separable and distinct from historical and documentation issues, a separation, I would argue, that neatly matches and implicitly works a logic of rationality, uh, fields of meaning which echo the imagined processes for using professional genealogists and historians and later anthropologists. It's an institutional ordering that is paralleled by the fact that accompanying the OFA solicitor to this meeting, that is the OFA officer who was leading this meeting, the lawyer, were two other researchers from his office, a historian and a genealogist. And this figuring is further reinforced, elaborated, and ramified out on an institutional scale when we recall that the solicitor then is joined by Dr. June Eddy, a genealogist, and Dr. Bill James, the historian. At approximately 22 minutes in the meeting, as recorded, the conversation turns from a discussion of the kinds of documents that are relevant as evidence of an individual member's genealogy to the number of records that would be sufficient to establish that, these, uh, individual, that this individual is not just genealogically an Indian, remember, one half blood quantum or even just some descent, but actually a member of a historic tribe or a member or uh, a, someone who claims descent from someone who is a member of a historic tribe. And it is precisely in this shift that uh, from the quality of documentary evidence of an individual's Indianness to the quantity necessary to prove the existence of an Indian tribe, that slippery scalability uh, between genealogy and history emerges as a problem of proof. The talks begins just after the OFA solicitor explains that the office will want to have from the petitioners copies of sample complete membership files, he then says to the tribal council uh, chairman, a tribal council member, uh, and the genealogist who are also in the room, uh, 
Um, okay, we have 1D referencing the different elements on his list, copies of sample complete membership files, but eventually we will review all membership files, which may necessitate a field visit. Some groups have submitted their membership files to their attorneys here in Washington, D.C., or some have gone ahead and submitted the entire membership files to this office. Uh, though the interaction up to this point has been figured around questions of the requirements of proof of individual genealogies, the request for membership files, uh, though such files contain documentary evidence of individual genealogies, seems to point to another scale of social phenomena, that is, of the entity to whom these individuals are, well, members. But when, the request, but when what is requested is only a sample of those files, and the answer to what exactly this larger scaled social unit is supposed to be is rendered, uh, we re it's revealed to be rather ambiguous. For what exactly is this sample supposed to stand for? At what level of scale does a sample somewhere between the individual member file and its genealogical information and the entire body of membership files and the totality of tribal ancestry fit? Where is it supposed to stand? The question is not just one for us, but also for them. That this is the case is evidenced by the response from the tribal chairman, who even after the solicitor explains that they will eventually review all the files, nonetheless asks for greater specificity about what exactly the sample should consist in. And he says this. Now, a sample of completed and very organized uh, membership files consists of what, 20? 50 to 100? More? Solicitor says, uh, well, we have looked at certain groups that initially have requested copies of membership files that would represent each ancestral family from, of uh, course, the genealogist interrupts. If you had 20 individuals from which all your members descended, uh-huh, then we would like one from each of those uh, descent in lines. Okay, at least. What more would you want? Note how, in taking up the question of sample, the tribal chairman proposes that the question of sample may be one of number. But in response to this proposal, maybe one of number. But in response to this proposal, the solicitor instead suggests that the question is not just one of number, but number as tied to matters of descent. Moreover, at lines 90 through 91, he does so in a way that points back to the mass noun ancestry announced in the BIA guidelines, but also done so here in a more scalable form, that is, each ancestral family. The move toward rendering the scalability countable is made even more concrete when the genealogist follows at lines 94 and 95 and 98 at 99, explain that the precise number of membership files necessary to count as a relevant sample should be tied to the number of individuals from which the current members descend, one from each of those lines. Here, genealogy becomes countable as history, where individual member files, one at least, can stand as evidence for the families that somehow together constitute the tribe, both historically, as it is imagined, and into the present. But the petitioner's representatives at the meeting, the tribal council chair, uh, member and chairman, still seem perplexed by the request for a sample of files, especially when a few minutes later the solicitor reiterates that a random sample won't do, but rather ones that show a kind of representative kind of dis, uh, ma manner of descent relationship. And so a few minutes later, the council member from the tribal group offers up a different possible solution of what might this sample be, framing it no longer in terms of number, but in terms of some kind of metaphorical centrality. She says, so, uh, no, the solicitor says, so um, that's what you must consider in providing to us. Clear links going back through the sample representative member file or files. So then the council member says, so what, like maybe a core? And the genealogist jumps in again. Well, a core, let me say, one from each line, at least, again. And the solicitor says, but each family needs, uh, line needs to be represented. 
the genealogist. Yeah, and to have and to make sure that you have a complete lineage record, you know, in each descent record, in each of those files, you know, which family they descend from. She says, gotcha, the chair council member. And what the links are back. And we can see cross links then to other lines if there are marriages and things like that. The flickering back and forth. Yeah, here it is. And then, and what the links are back, uh, and we can see cross links then to other lines if there are marriages and things like that. The flickering back and forth between spatialized metaphors of centrality like core, proposed here by the council member, implies a vision of the scalability of these records as capable of standing for the larger, undifferentiated, though hierarchically nested whole we might call a tribe. But this too doesn't seem to entirely satisfy, as the genealogist only partly takes up the metaphor and partly demands a refining that at once returns uh, to the question of representativeness of a distinct and countable number of family lines, whose significance count not just for their capacity to signify the whole, but also point with some specificity downscale back to the individual members. whose Indianness must still be established genealogically. In all these ways, and despite uh, uh, the posited rationality of a federal acknowledgement process that draws on expertise of genealogy, history, and anthropology uh, for the enduring Indianness of a tribal group and of its individual members, it seems that on closer inspection of the precise ways in which documents are imagined as standing uh, for, uh, in and for evidence as of evidence of Indianness at these different orders of social scale, we come to see how the center, both of this logic and of this logic as a centering device for making the measurement of a tribe simply doesn't hold. Now, I showed you this picture before. This picture is from March 17, 2011. It is from the actual day when, they had, when the tribe had been notified that they were going to hear the decision uh, from the uh, Office of Federal Acknowledgement about their petition. On March 17, 2011, I was standing in the headquarters of the tribal group whose chairman and council members had met with the OFA on that day back in 2005. The chairman had been informed earlier in the morning, he's there on the telephone there in the corner, lower corner, uh, earlier in the morning that the OFA had finally reached its decision and that the solicitor himself was going to call the headquarters of the tribe to deliver the news. The chairman had hastily put the word out into the community, and thus when I arrived at the office, well over 300 tribal members of all ages had descended on the place for an impromptu potluck. People were clearly excited and optimistic. The chairman himself explained that he was nervous but also optimistic, especially when he heard that the solicitor wanted to deliver the news via phone. He doesn't call if it's going to be bad news. And so it was quite a shock and a painfully public one. People were in tears uh, with digital cameras, phone cameras, and other recording vices trained on him that the chairman, still on the phone with the solicitor, then has to turn to his constituents and silently shaking his head, deliver the message that no one had expected. The community that was standing before me and before him had been informed that for the purposes of federal law, quote, they did not exist as an Indian tribe. When the 32 page final decision, final determination against federal acknowledgement was eventually printed up and poured over, many objected to what they saw as the nature of the decision and the suspect logics of it. While the OFA acknowledged that the documents submitted by the petitioner had established that the tribe currently had members who were descendants, um, currently had members, excuse me, uh, who were descendants of, an indiv of individuals of a historic Indian tribe. And while the documents had established that the community from which they claimed descent were indeed a historic Indian tribe, so they acknowledged that, there that these individuals were members of, were descendants of individuals of a historic Indian tribe, and that the documents had also established <clears throat> 
right? That the community from which they claimed descent was also a historic Indian tribe. The petitioner had failed to establish that their current members were in fact descendants of Indians of the same historic tribe. That is the historic tribe from which the petitioner as a group claims to have descended. Do you get that? Right. There are individual Indians whose, whose ancestors were, were from historic Indian tribes. There is a group that historically was recognized as an Indian tribe. Those two things don't converge in the group that today claims to be a historic Indian tribe, even though there was a group and there were individuals and both of them were in the room somehow. That's the logic here. That is, despite all the discussions, see, That is, despite all the discussions that seem to rationalize a lockstep relationship between genealogy and history and the scalability, the measurements, the ability to go up from one to the other that they presuppose between individual Indians and an individual tribe, somehow the non-scalability, the inability of these forms ultimately convince the OFA that the tribe that operates today as the Moreno Band of Mission Indians is not the same entity that operated historically and thus does not exist as an Indian tribe. I would argue that the problems of scale that the petitioners were so desperately trying to work through with the OFA in their technical assistance meeting uh, foreshadowed precisely the problems of scale that get attributed to their petition in the final determination. Neither scalability nor non-scalability alone suggests the promise and problems that the federal acknowledgement process posed for this petitioner, but rather the slippery movement between the logics of both that work like a kind of double bind to catch up this and maybe other tribes seeking federal acknowledgement. Now to conclude, I want to ask again, what could we say about the role of knowledge in this interaction? To what extent is knowledge of the sort that the OFA was deploying, of the sort that the uh, Moreno tribal members were attempting to grapple with, and of the sort that we as anthropologists are attempting to grapple with to understand what happened, how do they come together? What role do empirics play in this? What role do ethics play? To what extent is politics important? We can choose to emphasize one or the other of these different elements. But it seems to me that it's precisely in the way in which they come together that helps to explain how this moment happened in precisely the horrible way it unfolded. It strikes me that there are parallels in that sense between the Hopi claims of knowledge and its limits and the refusals to share it and the Moreno case that I've shown here. Limits of knowledge are as important as the knowledge itself in articulating the way in which the ethical the instrumental and the empirical come together. And they require that we understand those things in relationship together as the things that people themselves are grappling with. It means that when we talk about knowledge as a justified true belief, we have to understand that the justification operates on those levels of empiricism, but also with ethics and instrumentalities closely behind, if not at the foreground, of what it is we think we are knowing when we see. And we also have to ask, what then do those empirics, do those ethics, do those instruments demand of us when we ask whose authority is operative in these particular moments, and what is the nature of relationality playing out as well? What I want to know is, and I know for a fact that the OFA, though it said that they may have to do a site visit, actually never did it. What if they had? What if they had been there on the day that I was there when the decision was rendered? What if they had observed the relationships that I observed? What kind of knowledge would have been gained? Would it be one that escaped the scalability problems that I described? I don't know. Would it be the kind that would have the ethical implications involved that were tantamount to a kind of mis, uh, 
firing in the relationships and the competing obligations of the OFA and the Moreno. What would have happened with the politics that were on display in that moment? I can tell you that they were rife and ripe. The chairman of this tribe was a, a, a big time political player who, who quickly lost his position after this failure uh, and became somewhat of a persona non grata in the community, uh, which was also pretty horrific and sad to see. Um, would ethnography have helped? Instead of training those anthropologists to just talk to the people on the ground, shouldn't they have been talking to the OFA folks themselves about their processes and practices? I'd like to suggest that that's probably in the offing. And I would like to suggest, first and foremost, that if those OFA officers had been present on the day that that call came in, they would have had an awful hard time telling that that group that was there did not exist as an Indian tribe. Thank you very much.